This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guests today are Hilary Mann Leverett, Senior Professional Lecturer at American University, and Flint Leverett, Professor of International Affairs at Penn State University. They are the co-authors of a new book, Going to Tehran, Why the United States Must Come to Terms with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Welcome to my program. Thank you so much. Now, both of you worked in the government. Yes. Uh, is that where you met, or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, and so uh, you had various roles in, in national security focusing on Iran? I think, I think that for you know, Hillary and me both, our careers in government really span the high water mark of American primacy in the Middle East. They're not exactly coterminous, but pretty close. Basically, we were in government from roughly the period of the first Gulf uh, War in the early 1990s until um, March of 2003, just before the invasion of Iraq when we left our positions at the White House on the National Security Council staff. And that decade and change really is, as I said, the high water mark of American primacy in the, in the Middle East. And Hillary and I think in retrospect that we really had ringside seats to watch as, in our view, the, the United States really misused that primacy, misused its supremacy in ways that were grossly counterproductive for its own interest and for America's standing in international affairs. This was a period when the possibilities uh, for America to uh, essentially go for a balance, you know, in the region, uh, or uh, take the opportunity to assert, uh, uh, to, to, to take the opportunity to essentially dominate the region. I, I, I think that's right, that essentially coming out of the first Gulf War, coming out of the Cold War, the United States did have this um, unique choice that it could have, in a sense, consolidated its military primacy in the region and use that to manage the balance of power in a smart way, um, protect its core interests, and, and shape a balance of power in which American interests would be protected. But that would also mean recognizing that there are other powers in the region that have some independent interests of their own that have to be accommodated or respected in some way. And our argument is that really from the beginning, you know, even after the first Gulf War when uh, Bush 41 was still in office, through Clinton, of course through the George W. Bush administration, even up to Obama today, that America has instead basically tried to dominate the Middle East, to become a hegemon, to remake the, the region by micromanaging political outcomes and by basically being intolerant of uh, any possibility for independent um, actors, powers to emerge. In the now, uh, the period you're talking about, it, it was marked by the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was at that time, toward the end of the Bush administration, that Paul Wolfowitz drafted uh, the presidential mm -hmm. guidance document. Mm -hmm. and, and it essentially laid uh, the agenda you're describing out, because the argument was that the U.S., as the dominant power in that region and the world, the only superpower, mm -hmm. really uh, had 
uh, uh, an interest in preventing any regional power from uh, assuming that role. Yes, and I think that that I, I think that is a fundamentally mistaken view. Um, you know, hegemony is one of those things that it would be uh, nice in theory if you could get it, but in the real world, um, especially in the real world of the Middle East after the Cold War, even a state as powerful as the United States couldn't really um, establish itself as a hegemonic power on any kind of sustainable basis, and it was actually going to make itself weaker by trying. So, so your the, the your goal in writing the book was to draw on your experience, I would guess, mm -hmm. uh, but but also to to sort of see uh, the broader implications of the problem and and kind of the biases. Uh, built in into the way the U.S. views the region. Talk a little about that. Yes, we wanted to draw very much on our experience. We saw um, one of there were so many unanswered questions. We come we come back to the first pre the first President Bush's administration at his inaugural in his first inaugural speech in January 1989. He actually reaches out to the Islamic Republic of Iran because we still had hostages in Lebanon, which the Bush administration thought were acting as an albatross over us in the Middle East. And so then the first President Bush in his inaugural said, "Goodwill would beget goodwill. Essentially, if Iran took steps, we would reciprocate." Iran eventually does reciprocate, helps us get our last hostages out of Lebanon. And he's sending and messages is, through, the, through the UN. Too, yes, right? and he's sending messages through the UN. There's a UN envoy who is dedicated to doing this and works between shuttles between the Bush administration and then President Rafsanjani in Iran, gets our hostages out of Lebanon, gets Iran's neutrality in the Gulf War. And then after the Gulf War ends, the Soviet Union collapses, the Iraqi military is defeated, and then the UN envoy goes back to then National Security Advisor Scowcroft in the Bush administration and says, you know, the Iranians are now interested in what kind of reciprocity there, they will be, there will be. And Skullcroft says, I'm, I'm very sorry to have to say, tell you this, but there will be no reciprocity. And th there's the change. The United States didn't need to reciprocate as it did just in 1989, two years prior. So we wanted, we looked at all of these questions. Why didn't the United States reciprocate? What changed? What made the United States focused on dominance? We drew on more of our experiences. I was in, my first job in the State Department was during the Gulf War, 1990 to 1991. I was on the ground in several of our, Ameri in our, our embassies through the Gulf, including in Kuwait. And I saw in Kuwait at the time Kuwaitis, liberate, in liberated Kuwait, angry and concerned and anxious. Why has the United States left Saddam Hussein in Baghdad? Is it because they want to keep tens of thousands of troops here to restore the, the ruling family in Kuwait, keep all of these ruling families as they are and dominate the region? Even Kuwaitis, even at that time when here in the United States we all saw them as thrilled that they were liberated, were very concerned about the trajectory of American power in the region. So we looked at these questions. We looked at why, you know, why the United States was doing this, and we became very interested in this pursuit of hegemony and dominance. Then fast forward a few more years, and I'm again at the White House. I'm, in the State Department, assigned to the U.S. mission to the U.N. in New York. And I'm given this, this kind of rare opportunity to actually talk to Iranian officials, something almost never done by American officials. By U.S. law and practice, we are not allowed to talk to Iranian officials. But there's an exception. You can talk to them in a multilateral frame, f framework over multilateral issues that have nothing to do with U.S.-Iran relations. And that's where I was. I was in the 6 plus 2 framework to talk about Afghanistan before 9-11. So I talked to my Iranian counterpart. And and discovered, lo and behold, very professional, very educated, very knowledgeable, and our interests aligned. We had very similar interests, very similar concerns about the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And with 9 11, that multilateral dialogue then became a bilateral dialogue between the United States and Iran. There's this idea that we actually have had <coughs> tens of thousands of troops in Afghanistan from the beginning, uh, from right after 9-11. That's not true. We actually had just a few hundred CIA and special, office, special ops officers and air power. We actually worked with Iran to get access to Iran's allies on the ground, the Northern Alliance, 15,000 of them, to overthrow the Taliban and send al-Qaeda on the run. We were able to really cooperate with Iranian officials. They acted, in our kind of lexicon, as quintessential rational actors. So we wanted to bring these stories out, try to explain explain how the world looks from Iran's perspective, not to have sympathy with them, but to de develop something that is almost unheard of here in terms of how we see the United States, the okay, Middle East, strategic empathy. Okay, so, so uh, let's 
roll back a minute and uh, uh, because what your experience brings is a set of cases where uh, you are arguing that Iran uh, reached out to the United States mm -hmm. and we didn't reciprocate. Now, uh, but we, we've got to look at this in, uh, in the context of the region, basically. And essentially what we have is there's no doubt that uh, the U.S. is the world's hegemon. So the question becomes, how will it shape uh, the Middle East? And in the Middle East, what you have is two potential rivals to be the regional he hegemon. One is Israel and one is Iran, basically. Is that fair? I, I, I would take issue only with the description of Iran as a potential hegemon. I know that it's in the part region, of the conventional wisdom. Yeah. Right, uh, but it's part of the conventional wisdom here. I would characterize the Iranian view as more, they don't want anybody else to become a hegemon. They are very focused on their own uh, strategic and foreign policy independence. This is one of the driving values and goals of the Iranian revolution. Um, and they're very focused on that in their foreign policy. And so they certainly don't want a hegemonic Israel, but they also don't want a hegemonic Saudi Arabia. They don't, and they don't want an external power like the United States imposing its own version of hegemony on the region. And this is where, why we think that Iran is so critical in this choice between balance and hegemony for the United States. Because to pursue hegemony in the Middle East means, among other things, that the United States basically has to suppress a country like the Islamic Republic that is out to consolidate and protect its own strategic independence that won't be subordinated as part of a U.S. dominated regional order. The United States could come to terms with that, but it would mean we wouldn't be a hegemonic power. We would be an important power. We would be protecting and promoting our own interests in the region, but we wouldn't be a hegemonic power in the region. But instead, we chose to pursue hegemony. And, okay. and part of the conventional wisdom that, that is really incorrect, it, it assumes that Iran, because of its place, its structure in the international political order, will have the same regional and foreign policies as the Shah, mm -hmm. which is a hege was the Shah's policies were hegemonic. It disregards culture. It disregards the actors and influences on culture, on foreign policy in Iran, mm -hmm. which makes the Islamic Republic very, very different. The Islamic Republic looks at regional international relations and regional politics in terms of balance. What they want in the region is not pro-Iranian lackeys surrounding them. They want independent foreign policy actors surrounding them for balance. It's a very different foreign policy than the Shah. Okay, so, but, but what you're suggesting, uh, is, if one assumes that America is going to play a hegemonic role mm -hmm. in the world just because uh, of its military strength, its economic strength, and there's no rival in the world, then, then uh, there would seem to be a structural conflict built in with that perception of itself and the perception of the Iranians that you're describing. Is that there, fair? There, there, because there you're, be. you're asking, in other words, you're increasing the burden on the United States because it's not just about changing its role in the Middle East and recon recognizing Iranian interests, but it's really about thinking about its role in the world. It, 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 it is, but I think there is still, even within that structure, there's choice on both sides. You know, the, the Shah confronted with a certain situation, certain structure, uh, and an, an increasingly powerful America, the Shah makes the determination that he can actually increase Iran's chances of becoming a regional hegemon by, in effect, bandwagoning with the United States, and that's an important element of his foreign policy. But once you have a revolution in Iran and you have an Islamic Republic in Iran that is committed to foreign policy independence and restoring what it saw as Iran's degraded sovereignty, then you, know, you have a very different um, set of goals that come into play. The goal is to establish foreign policy independence for Iran and over time to see more and more countries in the region become independent in their foreign policies. 
that's in effect structure doesn't determine that choice you know the Shah made a certain choice within a structure the Islamic Republic made a different choice within <laughs> that structure the United States too has choices you know particularly coming out of the Cold War it could say okay we have important interests in the Middle East we are going to in effect manage the balance of power to protect those interests but that means we're prepared to come to terms with important regional players like the Islamic Republic of Iran particularly after you've just put Iraq in a box in the, after the first Gulf War the balance of power argument for some kind of rapprochement with Iran is very powerful but instead we under successive administrations deliberately um, put that away and instead say what we want to do is uh, remake the region. And right. there was a specific policy choice that had to be taken, that was taken in the 1990s, which very few people mm -hmm. really understand. Coming out of the Cold, cold coming out of the, out of the Cold War, the defeat of the Iraqi military, the United States essentially had two choices on its policy table in the Office of Policy Planning at the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. at, the, at the State Department. One was that it could have tried to construct a regional cooperative regional security order somewhat like the OSCE in Europe, that would have recognized each state as a state with legitimate interests and power and tried to bring it into a cooperative security mechanism for the region, which would have, by definition, meant a, a gradual but real diminution and withdrawal of U.S. troops and let security be something managed by the regional players. And it would have or, been a reduction in Israel's freedom of unilateral military initiative. Right. Yes, and, or, and, or the flip and, side, and, which, would, which would have been, and what we chose, which would was to organize the political and military order around a so-called peace process. And I say so-called because it wasn't really about a peace process. It was about bringing Arab states in a very weakened position into settlements with Israel on Israeli and American terms, to have a political order where there's an acceptance of Israel on its terms with its national security strategy of dominating its neighbors. That was the choice taken in October 1991 in Madrid, which we hail here as the great start of the peace process. But in effect, what it was was the, was the real start of a highly militarized U.S.-led political and security order in the region that eschewed balance of power politics and eschewed this idea of regional security for the region. This was the choice in, pol in the policy planning department of the State Department under Secretary Baker at but, the time. But the, 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 the issue becomes uh, America's commitment and support of Israel, which many people interpret as support for whatever Israel's current policy mm -hmm. issue, which, which are two different things. So, so w one thing that has to be critical in this analysis yes. is uh, Israel is there. We perceive it as a democracy, uh, a, a, uh, a, uh, uh, an example, a shining example on the hill of democratic values. And it's also a, uh, a hegemon. You know, uh, basically. So, so the 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 problem here is, as I see it, is you're you're realists. You're examining the the actual reality. But what when you come to putting a proposal on the table, which you did, it's very idealistic, given the realities of the existence of another hegemon who uh, has the political support in the country. Well, it's it, it's not idealistic in the sense that we think it's the only thing that would actually work to mm -hmm. sustain uh, a measure of American influence in this critical part of the world over the long term, that ultimately the pursuit of hegemony is, is self-defeating. Um, I take your point about, I mean, we are often called realists and we certainly don't have any problem with that. I think that one, um, and, and, and you know, we are great admirers of, of John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt and the work that they did um, on the Israel uh, lobby. Um, I at least you know, talked to them um, on the record for, for the book. Um, but I think that one way in which maybe we, we um, deviate a little bit from them on this issue is they see the American um, relationship with Israel and the way it affects American Middle East policy in terms of a kind of domestic political prism that because the Israel lobby is so effective at what it does, this distorts um, American policy in various ways. We certainly don't want to under um, underestimate the effectiveness of the Israel lobby, but I think we have a slightly different take, which is that 
part of why the lobby is effective is because it is pushing on an open door, a kind of ideological open door that's been opened by an American sense that what we want to do in the Middle East is dominate it. And the Israelis have been very successful at making the case in Washington that having this militarily dominant Israel that has nearly absolute freedom to use military force whenever, uh, for whatever purpose it wants, um, that having an Israel like that is actually good for the American strategic position in the region. It helps to keep other potential power centers in the region subordinated, and that is strategically useful for the United States. That really, I think, is the key, and in a sense, it's not really Israel that um, you know, got us to take this hegemonic position. It was the Israelis who figured out that the United States is going in this direction, and we can, in effect, piggyback on, on that, and they've done so very, very, um, very, very well. Uh, you uh, spend a lot of, at least a third of your book, talking about uh, Iran's vulnerabilities and what its strategic goals are. Mm -hmm. You've talked a little about that, but, but their, their geography dictates uh, their vulnerability. Talk a little about that. When I first started talking to Iranian officials through this exception where you could talk to them in this multilateral format, Iranian officials said to me, why don't you think about what the Islamic Republic does in its foreign policy in a much less, less politicized way than you'd normally think about it vis-a-vis -vis Israel and concerns surrounding the Arab-Israeli conflict. Think about Iran in its neighborhood, in Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, the threats that we have faced, we as Iranians have faced, without even thinking about Israel, just to think about that. And it is extraordinary when you think back historically. Iran has always been a focal point for great powers and for regional powers because of its resources, its tremendously educated and sophisticated population, its historic role, its production, its manufacturing, its arts, everything about Iran has made it attractive for penetration from both great powers, the Russians, the Soviets, the Brits, the Americans, as well as regional powers, the Iraqis and, and others. So to think about Iran's vulnerabilities, it has 15 neighbors, 15 neighbors. Now, I had studied the Middle East seriously as an academic and had never really thought about that number to have 15 neighbors and all of them not just hostile to the idea of an Islamic Republic but have actually taken military action against it that Iraq to Iran's east had actually invaded the country because it was an Islamic Republic and vulnerable with help from a lot of its other neighbors with help from from its particularly from the United States and from its its Arab neighbors to to the south which today now hosts then thousands of US troops with the most deadly American weapon systems, all poised to disarm the Islamic Republic of weapons of mass destruction it does not have. So to think about these vulnerabilities as a state surrounded by 15 hostile countries, invaded, having their diplomats killed in Maza Sharif under the Taliban's Afghanistan, really made us think about how the world looks from Iran's perspective. And again, not to gain sympathy, but real strategic empathy with the kind of foreign policy that they have derived. And that's why this idea of Iran as a hegemon actually makes no sense. They cannot be a hegemon with these kind of 15 different neighbors, many of them hostile to the Islamic Republic. What they can do is they can hope for, they can push for, they can try to create, help, assist outcomes on the ground beyond their borders that give those countries independent foreign policies and domestic systems grounded in Islam and participatory politics. So when I first started to negotiate with the Iranians over Afghanistan, I was shocked. We were focused on the air campaign, the military campaign. They were focused on the Constitution, that Afghanistan had to have a representative constitution. Why? It wasn't that they were necessarily great admirers of Jeffersonian democracy. Why was because if there was a a constitution in Afghanistan, it was a real representative political order based in Islam, but representative. That meant that Iran's historic allies, the Shia there that are called the Hazara, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, would come into a government and balance the historically, vitriolically anti-Shia Taliban Pashtun population. And that would give a guarantee for Iran's security, unlike some military dictatorship imposed. Same thing for Iraq just a, a year and a half, two years later. The thing they focused on in Iraq was not getting Shia militias in there to kill Americans. That's not what happened. What they focused on was the political order, to get a political order there and a constitution that would make Iraq a representative political order based in Islam. What that did was it 
elected, it brought to power their Shia and Kurdish allies. That's what gives them the security there, not Shia militias running around with, 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 with Kalashnikovs. Well, one of the problems I'm having with your argument is that building on your experience mm -hmm. where America, uh, the United States, uh, in its search uh, or in its consolidation of hegemony in the region, uh, uh, rejected initiatives from Iran. Mm -hmm. But but what, what I'm hearing and what I'm sure people in our audience are going to think is that you are examples of people who come to identify with the people you're working with to a point where you're going overboard in your analysis. So, for example, in what you were just saying, the the uh, it's reasonable to see Iran as wanting to protect Shia minorities, you know, in in the regions we're talking about. Uh, but on the other hand, aren't you overstating their desire for creating a democracy and a constitution in Afghanistan to guarantee the Shias? In other words, what I'm saying is you're you're overselling their blueprint and the arguments they probably made look, to you as look, diplomats. Look at Afghanistan as an example, because I think, again, Afghanistan is a less politicized atmosphere in terms of where the emotions come in. In Afghanistan, Iran tried in the early 1990s just to use their Hazara, the Shia, Afghan Shia, as their ally. It was a disaster. The, the Hazara, the Shia in Afghanistan are significant, but they're only 10 to 15 percent of, of the population. They couldn't do that. They needed to have an alliance with other groups within the country that were not part of this Sunni, Pashtun, vitriolically anti-Shia community. That was they, supported by Saudi Arabia. That was supported by Saudi Arabia right, right. and Pakistan. So they needed to align with these other groups. And the way to get to have this stable, to have this balance, is through not a perfect Jeffersonian democracy, not at all, but to have it enshrined in a participatory political order where their allies could form a coalition and be with other groups to to balance against basically the I, so. I think this is this is part of the the, the dissonance that our message creates in that ultimately the argument boils down to that I Iranians calculate, and we have come to think as an analytic matter that this is a correct calculation. They calculate that any state in this part of the world that becomes at all more representative of its people's attitudes, grievances, beliefs, what have you, any state in this area that becomes more representative is going to become by definition, A, less interested in strategic cooperation with the United States, much less Israel, and that is a big plus for Iran. And B, they're going to become more interested in foreign policy independence for their countries, uh, not subordinating their foreign policies. And that, too, is going to be a big strategic plus for Iran. Um, we're not trying to see it in idealistic terms at all. We're saying that Iran has a strategy to, um, to alter the balance of power in the region in ways that it will become much less threatening to Iran. Mm -hmm. And this is a really important part of that strategy. And what we're trying to argue as an analytic matter is that this is a strategy which is actually achieved an enormous amount. You know, if you look at the relative balance of power in the region, even just 10 years ago, where the United States was, where Iran was, fast forward, where's the United States today, where's Iran today in that balance? I think it's really hard to say that in relative terms that the United States is not significantly weaker today in terms of its ability to achieve its stated goals and that the Islamic Republic is in a relatively much better position today than it was even just 10 years ago. This is about strategy, and it's a strategy which is actually working Do you for make that argument in the book about uh, their wanting democracy in these places, uh, uh, if not Jeffersonian democracy? That argument isn't in the book, though, is it? I, th I, th I think it is. It, it is certainly, you know, implicit in a good deal of what we say about Iranian strategy in places like Afghanistan, in places like Iraq. Iraq, how the Islamic Republic has reacted to the, the Arab Spring. You do not discuss in the book the, the Sunni-Shia split, basically. I don't believe you do. I mean, in other words, this has to be a, a major 
factor motivating their foreign policy in the, in the sense that they support Shias. It's part of their soft power, which you talk about. Uh, but they are known to support Hamas, for example, yeah. uh, as part of uh, their, their real strategy. I mean, they, strategy. Can, they can do the math, you know. And yes, you're right, Shia solidarity, and we point this out in the book, Shia solidarity is an important theme in their foreign policy. But they can do the math. They know how many Shia Muslims in their heart, there are in the Middle East and the world compared to the number of Sunni Muslims. And if they are playing a strictly sectarian strategy, that is a losing proposition for them. And they are, they are very, very well aware of that. And so in country after country, in Afghanistan, in, um, in, in the Palestinian arena, as you mentioned, with Hamas, they are basically supporting um, you know, Islamic governance. They are supporting people who want to combine participatory politics and elections with principles of Islamic governance, whether they are doing that in a Shia way or whether they are doing that in a Sunni well, way. Well, and in fact, when we talk about in the book, that they're careful not to do it in a strictly sectarian way. So when they talk mm -hmm. about Bahrain, for example, they're not talking about the rights of Shia. They're talking about participatory Mm -hmm. uh, participa uh, particip participatory governance in a society. Now, they don't say democracy. For them, democracy is really a foreign concept that has been imposed for various various means and agendas that don't have anything to do with, in their view, the desires of populations. What they talk about is rep representative governance based in Islamism. They're very, very clear about that, and foreign policy independence. And our point is not that we sympathize with that, but we understand that that is powerful, not just in Iran, but all over the Middle least. And as a, as a young student in Egypt, it was something that I clearly saw and myself had cognitive dissonance over. For example, in my upbringing, Anwar Sadat was a hero, was an absolute hero for what he did. Then I get to Egypt as a student, and he's not perceived as a hero there. The reason wasn't because he had some favorable view for Jews. The concern wasn't being nice or not nice to Jews. The issue was that the United States was, had supported Sadat and was supporting Mubarak over the, ish, over the desires and interests of the population to serve a foreign American agenda, and that the settlement with Israel was really a settlement to lock in Egypt when it was weak and prevent it from being a strong player in the region. And I saw then that it wasn't that Egyptians were against democracy or political participation or they didn't have opinions. Of course they did. The, con the problem for them was that the United States was supporting a dictator that was not allowing their views and policies to be heard. Now, it's not that Iran comes in as the knight, white knight in shining armor to say, here, you can have democracy. No, it's that Iran realizes that if there are elections, even in a place, Sun a Sunni-dominated place like Egypt, it's going to produce a political order that is not pro-Iranian, but at least gives the Islamic Republic's foreign policy desires and interests a chance, and is not, you know, is the, not so the, focused on pro-American strategy. The problem that people strategy. have with, with, with us, I think, and we do get a lot of kind of personal attacks, but I think the problem that people have with us, they'll say it's a question of tone or this or that. The real problem is what we're saying is that, particularly in the Middle East, that is in which public opinion is mattering more than ever before that the United States does not have a narrative with which to compete for influence. We've got carrier battle groups coming out our ears, but we do not have a narrative to compete for influence. The Middle East today is becoming less a balance of power in hard power terms and more a balance of influence in which you need a narrative to compete. We at this point, the United States does not have a narrative. The Islamic Republic has one, and it knows how to use it to strategic effect. You're interested in uh, changing America's perspective on the world, uh, especially in this region. And uh, one of the problems I hear is you're trying to do that by making the case for Iranian foreign policy. The problem becomes that given uh, Iran's situation, which you're describing, they use as instruments of power uh, things like uh, 
if not going for nuclear weapons, at least keeping alive their nuclear program, exercising, which they have a, exercising their rights under the nonproliferation. Right, treaty. right, a, right. That that's correct. They they support groups which, in the American hegemonic perspective, and I'm not defending right. it. I'm just saying it are labeled terrorists. Groups but, that win elections. Right, right. What, but right, but what what we're we're, we're we're talking about the reality on the ground on the one hand and American perceptions, you know, That's on right. the other. And we're creating uh, yeah. cognitive dissonance. Right, you are, but you're you're using as a case, a case that's very vulnerable, to being dismissed, whether it's legitimate or not, not on the basis of rationality, but the emotions that can be generated by the American narrative. So America does have a narrative. That a narrative is that Israel has to be protected at all costs. Mm -hmm. Whatever uh, Israeli policy makers want is confused generally with Israel's national interest, mm -hmm. which may differ. Mm -hmm. uh, that any action taken by a potential adversary that makes perfect sense in realist terms uh, can, in the American narrative, be dismissed mm -hmm. because Iraq, uh, Iran is going for nuclear weapons mm -hmm. or uh, Iran is supporting terrorists. So there's a big problem here uh, in bringing rationality to the argument. That's all I'm describe our why, role very Which well. is one of the reasons why our book is called Going to Tehran. Okay. Because it comes from Nixon and Kissinger going to right. Beijing. Right. Before we discuss that, uh, we'll talk about your, I want to get into another point. Okay. Because you, you, we've, I think, laid out your case for the irrationality of American hegemonic goals mm -hmm. in the Middle East. You, you've laid out your case. But another important case you're making is that the uh, we do not understand That's right. uh, the domestic politics uh, of Iran because we cannot see their perspective on their goal in establishing an Islamic Republic. That's and right. the key point here that is for America as the, the leading uh, force in secularization, modernization, and globalization, the notion that there would be an important actor whose leadership combines religion and state power in one. So very briefly, if we're going to get to Tehran, yeah. give me an, your insight into why we misperceive the domestic situation and the Iranian case for combining religion and politics. Well, and we have a history of doing this, from the Bay of Pigs in Cuba I, to I, Iraq. I, I but, the, but the reason why that's well, important why, is because we you, don't want to know. We don't want to see what's really there, because then we can deceive ourselves into thinking it's not as powerful a, an enemy as it is, and we can defeat it we, and we pursue can, hegemony. We under, I understand what America's problem is. But, but what is the Iranian case for what they're doing? Oh, the, Iran, the Iranian case is that um, that the notion, both just the concept of democracy, the word itself is foreign, but more importantly, the Western notion of democracy is, is predicated ultimately on a separation of religion and politics. And the Iranian case is that, A, this is foreign to our culture, our beliefs. B, it's not just foreign, it's part of the way that Western uh, colonialists, Western uh, external powers, it's part of the way that they actually try to subordinate the Muslim world by trying to get modern Muslims to, to buy into this, into this argument. That, in fact, the only way that Iranians or Muslims in other societies that have been heavily penetrated by Western powers, the only way in which they can restore uh, a measure of genuine independence and sovereignty and, and really determine their own futures is by um, a kind of governance that will, it is grounded in Islamic principles, but also, and the Islamic justification for this is in terms of shura or consultative government, but that will also include participatory politics and elections. This is not secular democracy in the Western sense, but it is a kind of governance that both responds to the public um, and also 
allows the public to have a government which is in some fundamental ways looking out for their interests and not those of outsiders. And, That's and, the argument. And you make the argument that in not understanding this, we misread the recent presidential election. Yes. We, we misread the, uh, the uh, reform, conservative split in That's Iran, right. which is reflected in the election of different uh, kinds of presidents. Uh, yes. And all of this fuels uh, the second leg of yeah. uh, the failure of American policy, because the first leg is the, the search for dominance in the region or the consolidation of dominance. In, and the second leg is, well, these people have to be irrational. They have to be isolated because they don't believe in the separation of church and state. That's, that's, that's right. And, and this really does, you know, we basically want to keep telling ourselves, we've been telling ourselves for more than 30 years that this system is illegitimate, it's not wanted by most of the people in Iran, and that it is on the verge of collapse. And we have been telling ourselves this over and over again for more than 30 years. It's never true, but we keep telling ourselves this. And so in, in 2009, the last Iranian presidential election, we think somehow that Musavi represents all of these Iranians who want to get rid of the Islamic Republic. And so when instead, Ahmadinejad is reelected, um, the only explanation for it is, is fraud. That's the only possible explanation for it. Even though methodologically sound public opinion polls say otherwise, even though the Musavi campaign could never offer a shred of hard evidence of how fraud was actually perpetrated, that's what we prefer to believe. So, so let, let's talk a little about the nuclear program, because that's one of the big issues. And on the one hand, the, the two Ayatollahs, uh, Khomeini and Khomeini, basically have said that uh, nuclear weapons and, are immoral, basically. Mm -hmm. So we have that on the table. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, ability, the, the ability to have a nuclear program and to uh, be a great state go together in the sense that uh, having a nuclear program, you, you suggest the argument is made in Iran that it, it's a kind of industrial policy on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 given the evidence of what happened to Gaddafi and uh, Saddam Hussein, you know, one could make an argument that for their security, they might want to be on the threshold of being able to make weapons, although they won't make that decision mm -hmm. to, to go forward. Mm -hmm. So so the issue, uh, again, uh, and then finally, the notion is by not understanding uh, that this is an Islamic republic and not seeing modernity the way we see it, then they have to be irrational. So if they get the bomb, you know, they will immediately attack uh, Israel. Of course, uh, they, they have to live with the, the uh, misinterpretation or the actual words of the president mm -hmm. of, a, of, of Iran. So, so the problem is, I guess what, what I keep hearing is th this is a real, it will require a real gr breakthrough for the United States to accept the, the geopolitics of the region on the one hand, mm -hmm. and what is a reasonable strategy, and on the other hand, understand what an Islamic Republic uh, might right. look like. That's right, it's, that's exactly right, and that so is the, the challenge. And so the key to an agreement is not to try to prevent them from nuclearization, not to prevent their scientific and technological development. The key to a breakthrough is transparency, is to have uh, have an overall breakthrough where you diffuse the military and political tension, and within that, to get them to sign up to basically country neutral rules, like the additional protocol to the MPT, that give more and more transparency along the way. Because you're not gonna stop this train that's left the station, but you can build in more and more transparency in an atmosphere of, of mutual respect and trust and uh, reconciliation. Okay, so, so dealing with these problems, which, which your book, uh, uh, if, if one reads it in its entirety, uh, makes a, uh, an important case uh, for your view. It leads you to see the only solution to this set of problems is 
to follow the example of Nixon and for the president to go to 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 Tehran as uh, Nixon went to Beijing. So uh, make that case. Well, I think I think that that's right. I mean, the only um, I mean, the real really powerful precedent we have for the kind of of um, you know s strategic um, readjustment that we're calling for in the Middle East, the real powerful precedent that we have is um, the opening to China in the early 1970s. The People's Republic, like the Islamic Republic, I mean, obviously very, very different systems in a lot of ways, but these were both revolutionary states, came out of revolutions that were very focused on, uh, after periods of Western domination in their countries, on restoring sovereignty, on restoring real independence for those countries. And we in Asia, when the communists won for 20 years, we couldn't stand that. We wouldn't have diplomatic relations with the People's Republic. We tried to convince others not to do it. We tried economically to strangle it. We didn't, just, we didn't pursue just regime change. We recognized this whole other political structure in Taiwan as the real government of China. And the result was disastrous for the American position in Asia. You know, we wouldn't have been in Vietnam but for this really stupid okay. approach or Korea before. We really wouldn't have been in, in Vietnam, uh, but for this really, um, I think, ideologically driven uh, policy toward China that was grounded in a sense that America had to have hegemony in Asia. We couldn't accept an independent China and have the kind of regional order we wanted. And so we warped American foreign policy to pursue that hegemonic, um, that hegemonic illusion. Nixon came to office realizing that this had to change. And in order to change, he had to be prepared to accept the People's Republic as a legitimate and enduring entity that represented real national interests and come to terms with it on that basis. And we think that was one of the most brilliant moves in American diplomatic history. It saved the American position in Asia and restored a sense that the United States was a great power which could proactively shape important strategic outcomes in a positive way. Fast forward to the Middle East today, our strategic position in this part of the world is in free fall. The only way we can, we argue, that we can bail it out is by coming to terms with this rising independent um, revolutionary state, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And like with China, that is going to require us to accept the Islamic Republic as an enduring entity representing legitimate national interests and come to terms with it on that basis. You, you point out that, that it, throughout all these administrations, we've really uh, been supporting groups that seek the overthrow of the Iranian government. So, so this failure to accept the legitimacy of the Iranian uh, of the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, goes with uh, a program of uh, subversion and support of organizations like the MEK. Yeah, I think that's right. And it starts largely after the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and the defeat of the Iraqi military. In the 1980s, we, you know, we had basically a proxy conflict in some ways in Lebanon with the Iranians, but we weren't so much after financing um, and supporting groups that would really overthrow the Islamic Republic. It's not until we think that we can have hegemony, that we can really dominate the region, that in 1994, there's the first allocation, allocation in Congress of real money to support opposition groups in Iran, and that has exponentially increased ever since. And that's been bipartisan. That Absolutely bipartisan. This yeah. is not a liberal, uh, conservative, democratic, re Republican issue. This is something that has not only bipartisan consensus among fo American foreign policy elites and I think the, the broader American public, but ideological consensus. Now, now if, if one were to envision a, a, a new Nixon uh, uh, making the changes you're calling for, I, 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 I wonder what uh, would change the political configuration domestically. You analyze U.S. policy. Uh, you point out the, the, the essentially coalition of groups that uh, support a policy of continuing the path we're on, supporters of Israel, uh, liberal interventionists, 
uh, emigres, uh, uh, undoubtedly the, the military industrial complex, there may be others. So, so what, are, are you idealists with regard to American domestic policy in the sense that, that you think that a, a rational argument will change things, or do we have to wait until the failure of America's position leads to a, a decline of American power or, unfortunately, to war? Well, in some ways, we think that there already is a relative decline in American power, which is one of the reasons why we think this argument is very important to consider right now. But the other thing we think is, is critically important to focus on is the element of presidential leadership. This is not something that is going to come organically from our domestic constituencies clamoring for acceptance of an Islamic Republic. That is not going to happen. Similarly, it didn't happen with the acceptance of the People's Republic of China. There was a, there was a strong Taiwan lobby here, a strong anti-communist lobby here. There we were a variety— our own, our own version of patriots on mm -hmm. this issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And within the within the foreign policy and elite and media, there were there were strong segments of the American body politic that were dead set against it. In fact, John Kennedy had the initial idea to have a rapprochement with with China, but Eisenhower told him that he would support told Kennedy he would support him publicly as a president on almost any issue unless he contemplated rapprochement with the People's Republic of China. There were strong constituencies here against rapprochement with China. Nixon led, Nixon and Kissinger, but Nixon in particular, led the American body politic to see this in, as in American interest. And that's why we also call the book Going to Tehran. It is not only trying to understand what works for Iran to shape, increasingly shape the Middle East balance of power, but why the U.S. president, why there needs to be U.S. leadership to go to Tehran to accept it, like Sadat goes to Egypt, like Nixon goes to China, to accept the People's Republic, the Islamic Republic of Iran requires presidential leadership. It's not going to come from coalitions of, of domestic constituencies that are so grounded in the pursuit of hegemony. Now, and, and, it, and if we don't do it, the alternative is going to be continued uh, sharp decline of American standing in this critical part of the world, and we think eventually another U.S. initiated war in the region as Hillary put it, to disarm another Middle Eastern country and weapons of mass destruction doesn't have. And the blowback to the U.S. position in this regional environment, the blowback to the U.S. position, if it does that, will almost, I think, destroy the U.S. position in the Middle East. That's the alternative. You know, one of the, the problems here, in addition to all this coalition of forces against this, is the, uh, and, and I guess this is why you're looking for presidential leadership, because uh, you quote Nixon as saying, you can't do anything half completely. If you're going to do it— You're going to get it, blamed. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, anyway, so you have to do it completely. So basically what you're saying is, if we look at what Nixon did, it was in secret. It was a top-down approach. Yes. And he just did it, and he did it himself. And then he sprang and a fed up completely. And he went there and, and very clearly said, we recognize the legitimacy uh, of the mm -hmm. communist mm -hmm. uh, state of of uh, of, of China, uh, and I guess as a as a realist on domestic politics, in addition to being a realist on international affairs, I I, I am still looking for a handle to move in this direction. I mean, if we look at the case of Obama, I mean, he one was led to believe in the campaign. Mm -hmm. You know that that he might be uh, a person who might do this, but in fact he was captured by the bureaucracy and the and the existing coalitions. So so what where where do you see the surprise president? coming from? It could still come from Obama. He did, he had what I would say were strategic impulses, not a fully thought out strategy or vision or understanding of how hard it would be. And this would be hard. It would require real political capital. But he still could do it. He could do it, especially in a, in a second term as it's configured with the Secretary of State Kerry, who has said that trying to, to, um, to close Iran's nuclear program would be ridiculous. He can do it with the Secretary of Defense Hagel, potentially even with the Vice President Biden. 
Biden. In the first term, I don't think he was so much captured by the bureaucracy, but he decided to try to co-opt it, to bring it along, to bring about some other kind of agenda uh, domestically. That failed. He, I think, realized that that failed. And so he has taken some political risk in terms of his second term appointments. It would still require a lot of political capital. I'm not very hopeful he's going to do it, but it is certainly still possible. And the problem that he faces, if he doesn't do it, by the end of his presidency, he may have to face the very stark choice of admitting American irrelevancy in the Middle East or going to war to protect it. Mm -hmm. But aren't you overstating American decline in that region? I mean, uh, one can accept the unraveling of our initiatives, mm -hmm. our being on the wrong side. But, but aren't we needed there to protect the oil supplies of Europe and China and Asia? Uh, not so much necessarily because we're as dependent on oil as we, as we were. We, we still obviously have a unique capacity to so carry battle groups out out the wazoo, we have a unique capacity to project um, large amounts of conventional military power in the region, and that's a, something we'll be able to do uniquely for, for some time to come. The issue is, though, are we in fact using that power in ways that actually um, increase the security of oil flows to international markets? You know, I would say the biggest threat to the security of those oil flows out of the Persian Gulf is not that Iran will take some initiative, it's that Israel and or the United States will start a war with Iran. That's where the real threat to energy security comes from. Did the Iraq war really somehow make Persian Gulf oil flows more secure? I mean, we go to China every year. I don't think people in China or people in other rising countries that depend on Persian Gulf oil think that the Iraq war made their energy supplies more, more secure. The U.S. could still play a very, very constructive and important role in the Middle East. It certainly has interest there. But it needs a very, very different strategic approach. And one of the important that. manifestations that you see of the decline of American power are regional states, and not specifically Iran, but Saudi Arabia, for example, taking matters more and more into, into their own hands because they are so concerned about the precipitous decline of American power. But they're also concerned about Shia Iran. But well, this is a strategy that they're using. Their concern about the precipitous decline of American power has led them to push this, the sectarian card to fund, arm, and train vitriolically anti-Shia and anti-American groups in Libya, in Syria, and Afghanistan to hold on to their position mm -hmm. and make the issue not about people's wanting more political participation in their own in their own states, but about Sunni sectar Sunni Shia sectarian divide. That's what the Saudis are pushing, and they're doing so in large part because they feel they can't rely on the United States to secure okay. them. Okay, so we're we're coming to the end of the program. Let let me summarize, and then you make any additional point you want. You you are saying that America's uh, inability uh, uh, or a choice not to understand Iran's strategic position and what they really want is combined with a lack of understanding of uh, what it means to have an Islamic Republic mm -hmm. uh, 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 which, which sees religion and politics linked. And that is preventing the U.S from understanding the virtue of a balance of power strategy in the region, which would then see that Iran and the U.S. have many common interests, which could lead to negotiations and not war, which could bring stability to the region. Is there something I'm missing? The, the only thing I would alter is I would go, I would state it stronger. It's not just that there are common interests that we could realize if we had a better relationship with Iran. I think it's more imperative than that. I think at this point, the United States can't achieve any of its core objectives in the Middle East absent a better relation with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yes. It's not just a nice to have thing, it's a need to have thing. Well, on that note, and uh, I think this was a, a very uh, lively discussion, <laughs> uh, so let me show your book one more time. And uh, thank you very much for being on our program. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you very much for watching uh, this conversation with history.